Welcome to the Heartbreak to Happiness Show with Sara Davison. If you're struggling with a breakup and you feel shocked, angry, betrayed, devastated, or sad and alone, then this podcast is for you. Best selling author and award winning host Sara Davison shares how you too can get on with your life to heal, grow, and move from heartbreak to happiness. Here's your host, Sara Davison. to the show and today my guest is Lady Jen Duplessis. Jen is affectionately known as the impact and transformational mentor. She works with high achieving sales professionals, leaders and entrepreneurs and has numerous Amazon best-selling books. Jen is also the host of two top ranking podcasts and producer and host of her TV show Tell Me I Can't which reaches over 350 million homes every month. Jen is a highly sought after charismatic speaker and has shared stages with such icons as Tony Robbins, Les Brown and Sharon Lecter, amongst many more. And she's been featured in numerous articles and covers of nationally recognized magazines in America, including LA Weekly and Success Profiles magazine. So I am super excited to welcome Lady Jen Duplessis to the show. Welcome, Jen. Thank you so much. I'm so excited. We've had some fun together and we're going to continue to do this. I can't wait. I know. I mean, it was fun to see you again in the States when I was over in LA. That was fun. It's always good to see you. And you gave me a demonstration of your dancing with your husband, which is insane. (laughs) I forgot about that. Yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> a woman of many talents, many, many talents. But we'll come on, we'll come on to that. But Jen, for people who over here in the UK maybe don't know so much about the amazing work you do and all the people that you inspire, tell us a little bit about maybe how you got into this, because I know you started out in a very different place to, to where you are now. Yeah, well, well, let's talk about where I started off. Um, so I am I am one of 36 first cousins. Yeah. Uh, so we have this big, big Catholic family. <laughs> uh, my, mom, my mom's one of 10. Yeah, and so some of the families had six kids and the rest of them had uh, three. Nobody had four. Nobody had five. Everyone had three or two, plus the two families that had six. And, um, and I can rattle them all off because I, I'm the seventh oldest, so I know all of them, right? Um, it's more difficult now knowing the second cousins and the third cousins uh, for myself. But, uh, you know, my calendar of birthdays and anniversaries is just crazy. Um, it's That's just every crazy. day of the year, I would imagine. It, it almost is at almost every day. It's, it's pretty funny to see uh, certain months that there's just a lot going on. And I count backwards and go, what the heck? Um, but, uh, yeah, so I was one of 36 first cut, co- you know, I am one of 36 first cousins and, uh, my family, my mom, she was the middle child. So if you call that a middle child in family, and then my aunt, uh, who's the other middle child, she's kind of like my mom, they're like middle child syndrome. And, uh, you know, of all of these families, not to say that everybody had money, but a lot of them have money. And uh, we didn't. And my dad was a beer alcoholic. He wasn't abusive until my mom's voice started making him get angry. And and I think at some point he needed to defend himself. And that that's where the abuse came in. But but he wasn't abusive. In fact, I recall my father being the happiest drunk ever. And anytime he was drunk, it, I loved it because then I got attention. And oh. I was an only child until I was 12 and a half. So those formidable years where it forms what your your children are going to be like or what we are like, um, I consider myself to be an only child, right, at that point. And uh, my mom was a verbal abuser, so she bullied me with her mouth. And that was because she didn't know who else to bully. If she couldn't bully dad, who could she bully? And so we were this this you know, the family that was poor, the family that, oh, he's drinking, be careful, you know, her mouth might take over, they could embarrass us in front of public, and my mom didn't care. And uh, many times my father, um, who who was also, he was an uh, entrepreneur, a uh, general contractor, so he had his own carpentry business, master carpenter and cabinet maker, Um but he also volunteered for the fire department. And so we'd get those calls in the middle of the night and my mom would wake me up and 
make me go to all the fires because she was watching over him to make sure he didn't go drink afterwards. And so that was disruptive. But I think, uh, and there were times when he went by himself and then didn't come home. And my mom said, hey, get in the car. We're going looking for him. And uh, many, many stories where she had me going into bars at two, three, four in the morning to get my dad and retrieve my dad. And she'd say to me, I remember just one time she said to me, um, you know, if you don't get him, I'm just going to leave you here. You can walk home. And I was probably seven or eight at the time. And it was, and my dad didn't even know who I was. I walked into the bar and pulled on his pant leg and he's like, who are you? He was so trashed and so drunk. And, Mm -hmm. and, um, so, you know, so my whole life was just walking on pins and needles. And I thought, you know, I'm never good enough. You know, if I'm perfect, maybe they won't drink, maybe they won't yell, but I was just never good enough. So that, that whole, that whole thing took me into my business world and and really into my teens as well as I was everything. I was runner up. I was Miss Colorado Springs. I was runner up Miss Colorado. I played flute and piccolo in the Colorado Springs symphony in Colorado in the U S um, And, uh, you know, I was pre-med, I was going to be a cardiologist. I was tennis champion. I was a cheerleader. I mean, in perfect grades, right? Perfect, perfect, perfect. And they still drank and they still fought and they still whatever. And I prayed that they would get a divorce because it was awful, but they never did. And so there's, there's two sides to divorce, I think is, you know, the, the toxic relationships you should get out of. Mm-hmm. And the relationships you should really try to, you know, move forward with, they didn't get it. They should have divorced. Later, he stopped drinking. My mom says he stopped drinking. I, I say he didn't. He went to non-alcoholic beer. He still had the, the drink. And, um, you know, and they were happier. They were much happier, but she still had a mouth. And that still provoked all kinds of problems in the relationship. And when he died, I thought, I don't know how he lived with her. I just don't get it. I mean, God bless him. He's a saint because I don't know how he lived with her, how he created, how that mouth, um, you know, no wonder he drank. It almost drove me to drink, yeah. <laughs> right? Just dealing with her. So, so God bless him. I don't, I don't blame him. I don't blame her, but uh, you know, I mean, coming up in that kind of relationship. And of course that, that, you know, took me into business and I had to be the best at everything. It, because it was just normal now for me to be the best at everything. I've since passed that. I don't have to be the best at everything. I have to be the best for myself, but, oh, yeah. but I had to get through that. Yeah. I guess yeah. growing up though, in that, what sounds like a very dysfunctional relationship um, <clears throat> must've formed some views for you because they are role models on what love is and what marriage is yet. You know, you've gone on to have a very successful marriage, 40 years, which I think deserves a round of applause. Is that insane? I just can't um, even believe it when I hear it. <laughs> yeah. I, know, I know, it's crazy. And I've met your husband. He's absolutely gorgeous. Um, you guys are obviously madly in love. How did, you, how did that happen when you've got such a dysfunctional role model example growing up? Well, and listen, it, it wasn't all wonderful. You know, I... I think, uh, you know, to give some context, you know, you have to understand my husband, what he came from, and then I'll show you how we kind of married that together. But, you know, his dad was in Vietnam. He did three tours of Vietnam, um, you know, it was kind of wackadoo when he came back, um, physically fine, emotionally different, but his mom loved, um, an actress in the U S that I can't think of her name, but anyway, she's been, um, married a hundred times, you know, she's a thousand times. And I think she just wanted to be her. Because every time that Brian's father, they were stationed in Hawaii. And every time that Brian's father was, um, you know, on his tour in Vietnam, his mom would be out carousing. And so he, you know, there's two years difference between himself and his, his two younger brothers. So they're all, you know, five, three, one, (laughs) right. 2018, 16, those ages. And he was the eldest. And so she would leave and he'd have to cook. He'd have to clean. He'd have to take care of them for the whole weekend sometimes. And this is when he was seven or eight years old. So imagine a seven or eight year old being left alone and babysitting all these other kids. So he started creating this resentment for his parents of you're away. So the mouse plays, but the mouse, you know, now she's a problem and, you know, just creating all this resentment. So they ended up getting divorced three times to each other and getting married to each other four times. And they, they, (laughs) when they, when they passed away, they were married. Right. 
for the longest period they'd ever been married, I think 15, 16 years. Um, and funny, his mom said, we're going on a, uh, we're going on a cruise uh, for people who've been married for 40 years. And this was probably 20 years ago. And I said, you haven't been married for 40 years. And she said, well, in spirit, we've been married for 40 years. I said, no, you haven't been married in 40 years because it takes a lot of work yes, right, to it does. For, for that long. And, uh, you know, so, but then she went on to marry other people. And then he married one person the night before we got married and never showed up at our wedding. No. So yeah. Yeah. So, and then he was married to her for like 16 years um, until he went back with his Brian's mom again. And um, so Brian had this, you know, and still does has a little bit of this um, lack of trust. You know, if I'm not there, where am I? Where could I possibly be? And it was challenging in the beginning because he was like a thumb on me. You know, he was controlling. I He gave me $20 and I'd ask for more money. And he'd say, well, let's go through exactly where every penny went. Um, so just lack of trust, you know, and always thinking that I wanted something better than him. If we got to say, well, you just want something better. And I, said, I chose you, but if you're feeling that way, then I don't know what to tell you. So we were separated for a year during our marriage. Um, and the kids were probably, this is probably around that seven, eight, nine year itch. You know, yeah. we were separated for a year because he just didn't have the maturity to work through our relationship. It was always just, you know, as if we got into an argument, it was always go to the end and you probably, you want a divorce. You don't want me anyway. And that's not it. I was just trying to work through it. Um, and it was a challenge for me because all I had seen was just fight. Don't talk, just fight. And so because I was an only child, I never really learned how to, and I'm not an only child. I have a brother who's 12 and a half years younger than me, but we just feel like we're only children. Um, but I didn't know how to fight. Isn't that, doesn't that sound weird? Like, I didn't know how, you yeah. know, how when you have, you have siblings, you pull each other's hair and you fight. Exactly. And you, yeah. I just didn't know how to do that. I, the only thing I knew what to do is when there's fighting, I just retrieve. Right. right? Retrieve. And. So for two weeks, we didn't talk one time because I um, didn't like the way he cleaned something. And he's like, what's wrong? And I, nothing, nothing. And that was my form of communication, right? Yeah. But I think that what we did is we learned together how this is successful is that we just, we're hell bent that we're not gonna repeat history. We're yeah. hell bent. We are hell bent that we are gonna have fun, holidays, not holidays where someone drinks, fights, turns over tables, hits somebody, gets a shotgun out or oh, holidays okay. where I had to spend with mom and I had to spend with dad and I had to, you know, and, and maybe I, his dad was never around when he, when, when they were divorced, his dad would disappear. So he really never had that relationship with his dad. So, you know, it was just, we can't afford it. We're struggling this, that, and the other. I had that too. We're always struggling. We can't afford, we're struggling. Dad drinks too much. We smoke, too, they smoke too much cigarettes. I hid their cigarettes once and my dad found out I got a spanking with his belt. Ooh. Not a whipping, just a spanking with his belt because I thought if they think they're spending too much money, maybe they'll they'll stop smoking yeah. or whatever. And I was hiding all their, their things. But um, I think- are we we always think of it as team well like we're lean to and sometimes i need him more than he needs me and we vice versa sometimes i'm more the parent he's more the parent our, our kids are grown we have four grandkids now but sometimes he takes that lead sometimes i take that lead we we learn to kind of do the push and pull um you know and that's just you know it's it's worked for us over over the years we're just like team 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 <laughs> we're always high-fiving and pounding with team teamwork yeah. right and um, i think i think that really helped but we've had problems we've had problems in the last couple of years i can tell you about that too and why yeah yeah well i mean if you're open to sharing that i'm sure we'd love to hear because you know it, it's very true sometimes when you're single and a lot of people listening will be single haven't gone through a breakup you tend to look around the room and look at every other couple and think you know why am i on my own you know i'm unhappy but actually you know, being on your own can be very empowering and you can be super happy on your own. But also it's not always what you see behind closed doors, is it? So yeah. some of those relationships are not as healthy maybe or as happy 
behind closed doors. And maybe they just those guys are working super, super hard to, to make it work. Yeah. And and we do. We have to, you know, work really, really hard. Um, you know, we uh the, the, our kids call us the Bickersons. <laughs> <laughs> We, you know, we don't, we don't typically have a, you know, drawn out blow up kind of thing. Maybe that comes once every two, three years, you know, I'm, I'm German. So I'm, I'm just a slow, steady, you know, where if you think about a, um, um, what is that thing called a roller coaster, right? Cause I can't stand them, yeah. but I'm a slow, steady, 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 steady for a couple of years. And then I'll have a blow up and then I go and I'm done. He is Italian. So he's up and down and all around and this and that and slow and fast and yanking. Right. So I've always just trying to balance out that, that even kill. And he can be a hothead where I'm not, I'm just not. And so I just recognize that that's what it is. He, you know, he's just that way, but um, so two years ago in a couple of days, in a couple of days would be two years, Brian had a traumatic brain injury and it was, um, I wouldn't say self-induced, but he, because he's so high strung, he takes stress on differently than I do. Um, and so, so what happened is he had something that attacked his body and, um, his brain and it, it he has a coin size behind his left eye, permanent brain damage, and he has short-term memory loss now. And um, so long-term memory seems to be okay, but the short-term memory is, is different. And his personality has changed because he's struggling with the short-term. He gets mad at himself. And so he gets mad at everything and everybody around him. So he's even more of that now than he was before. And it's been a challenge last couple of years. And, you know, we, we are very faith-driven. Um, we, we, you know, just focused on that and said, you know, better, worse, health, sickness and health. And I get that people don't, I, I, we get it. We get that. Um, but I'm saying sickness and in health and right now he's in sickness. And so people said, you know, recently, well, I'm okay now, but about a year, year ago, people would say, well, how long have you been married? And I go, well, technically 38 years, but really only one year because I've married, I now I'm married to a new person. And it's like we had some kind of emotional divorce and now we have a new life. It's a new way of living. And it is not like it was for 38 years. It is completely different. But we are so grounded in the base love that we have for one another, grounded in our faith, grounded in um, that team that, you know, and now it's, I would say our marriage is more of a friendship than anything else because I'm now a caregiver and he's now a receiver of that. And, and you've met him. You yeah. wouldn't know that he has that because you no, don't, I no idea. Don't, yeah. You wouldn't be around him enough to know. Um, but he's like more fun loving than he was before. He was always like that, but he's more of that. He's so he's more of the good and, but he's also more of the bad. <laughs> <laughs> right. And right. that's a challenge for me to try to figure out how to maneuver through. And even my kids don't, you know, my daughter sees it because she works with him, but my, my son's like, be, be nice to dad, be nice. I'm like, you come and live with him for six days. And then you tell me because he goes in circles, you know, and you never know what you're getting. And um, so it's been a challenge. There's no question about it, but um, but it's not a challenge. It's enough for us to say, oh, that's it. I don't, you know, sorry, too bad you had your little problem. I'm going to move on. It's not that. It's just that, um, you know, life, life has challenges. Relationships have yeah. challenges all the time. And, you know, one of the things that we've done is every year before our anniversary, we have a recommitment ceremony with ourselves, right? It's, we meet and we say, what do you want this year? What do you want? What do I want this year? Ooh, what do this. we want? Yeah, that's right? a great thing to do. And I, and I told my kids about it and now they do it. My son's been married for 13 years happily and everything's great. Um, and my daughter's been married for four years and uh, we'll see. <laughs> but my, my son's just really happy. And they have that commitment meeting every year is what do you want to achieve? What do I want to achieve? And what do we want to achieve? And we and, and analyze what we had last year. So we're on the same page all the time. It's not, I want to be a real estate investor. Well, I don't want to be a real estate investor. You know, we, we have, we're on the same page that we know uh, what we're trying to achieve throughout the year so we can help each other. 
And by the grace of God, we have renewed our vows every 10 years and we're renewing our vows again in July. So we're excited about that too. Oh, I love that. I think that commitment, again, sort of re- reaffirming what you're both doing, because we all change, as you've just explained there. I mean, sometimes quite dramatically. And so we need to keep realigning. I mean, you know, you think, oh, well, after, you know, 30 years, you know each other well enough. But I think that pulling it back every year and reassessing and checking in on each other is probably something that most people don't do, right? So and also I think it shows a real you know, this is true love. This is what love is, that through sickness and health and, you know, it's tough times and the good times, you work through it together and that dynamic yeah. shifts and, and there's tougher times and easier times and happier times. But, you know, that, I guess, is a, is really testament to you, Jen, and, and the, the bond that you have and the strength of character you have. Um, I mean, obviously, you're a very successful uh, businesswoman, and that's something that you're well known for. I know you do a lot of talks and a lot of events, um, and I've heard you speak. You're phenomenal, and you give, always give such good advice to people. When you're in a, a, a relationship, you know, being as successful as you are, how does that dynamic work? And have you got any <laughs> advice for other people listening and maybe have their own businesses or are successful in their own right with that dynamic? Sometimes that can be tricky. Hey, it's Sarah Davison here, the Divorce Coach. I hope you're enjoying this episode of Heartbreak to Happiness. I just wanted to let you know about a free gift I've got for you, which I know will help you if you're struggling with your breakup or divorce right now. I'd like to offer you a free week's membership of my Heartbreak to Happiness online support group sessions with unlimited access to any of the groups during this time. So what are they? Well, these are friendly and confidential online support groups run by my accredited coaches. I've designed them to ensure that you know you're not alone and there is help and support out there to help you cope better. One delegate, Jane, said after her first session, I can't believe how much better I feel in just one hour. Another delegate, Wendy, said, my friends and family are so fed up of hearing me talk about this, and now I finally feel like I've found my tribe. I've designed these sessions so you'll meet other people going through similar situations, and you will be able to share your story in a safe space. My specialist coaches are all trained personally by me and are there to offer support and help to enable you to dial down those negative emotions and let go of your ex. So I wanted to make a special offer to all my podcast listeners, which is a three weeks access to this unique support. It means that you will have access to as many support sessions as you would like to attend in a week. And we've got lots of days and different times to choose from. This is a great way to start to take your power back and help you feel more empowered. Remember, as I always say, it's not what happens to you that defines you. It's what you do about it that makes you the person you are. So sign up now at www.saradavison.com forward slash support group. That's saradavison.com forward slash support group to claim your free gift and to move from your heartbreak to happiness. Yeah, it can be. And, you know, look, there was a period, and in fact, I just did some work on this about, um, I had a breakthrough myself personally. You know, my DNA is the driver, right? I come in with, I gotta be better, gotta be enough, gotta be this, gotta be, gotta prove to everybody. Mine is the driver. His is not so much the driver in business, but guess what? His is the driver in family. So I think figuring out what your drivers are are going to be really important because his driver is like people used to say, he's the best father. And I used to sit around because me, I'm going, aren't I good enough? Right. All the time. So I'm going, well, wait a minute. What's wrong with me? Aren't, why am I not? Why aren't you saying I'm a good mother? Because I didn't need to prove that. Because I had enough family around me. My grandparents, my uncles were around me that I didn't have to prove that. My parents weren't there. My mom was a little bit, but 
but my grandparents and my uncles and everything were around me. So I didn't need to prove that his proving is I'm not going to be like my parents. I'm going to be there for you for every single thing. And it's like, I don't, de- I don't need to be there for everything. Um, I want to be for all the recitals and stuff like that, but I don't have to be at every practice. I don't have to be at every birthday. I don't have to be at every, everything. And he has that drive there. I have the drive with business. And so we recognize that. And this is where that lean to comes in is that there are times when I do have the drive for family. And there are times when he does have the drive for business. So we're very careful to make sure that there's not too much of a spread and especially with my success, you know, I'm, i and I don't want to boast of, I mean, I'm very, very successful compared to him, right? Really, really much more successful compared to him. And he loves being in that position. And I'm sure he told you I'm the B plus, yeah. you know, I'm around a bunch of A's and I'm the B plus and he likes being in that position. And I think it takes a really strong man to stand Absolutely. behind a, a, you know, a strong woman, but a even stronger man stand behind a powerful woman. And, but I'm careful not to have too much of a spread. I'm I'm careful to reach back down and say, Hey, I just want you to know, I'm, I'm so excited about what's happening in my business. I'm about ready to go to the next level. And by the way, we don't talk about business. I don't know. I don't, I know a little bit. I mean, I know what he does because I used to do it for 30 years, but we don't talk about that. I don't talk about what's happening in my business, but I reach back down and let him know, hey, I just had this milestone and I'm about ready to go another level. I just want you to know what's happening Um, because I don't, it's like dancing. You saw us dancing, right? I'm a competitive ballroom Latin and swing dancer. He's a dancer. He's not a competitor. So when he gets a little too, you know, or I get too advanced and he's not there, I tell him, you got to go take a bunch of lessons before I kill you when we dance, right? I can't have too much of a spread in that success, no matter what it is. Um, and, and he realizes that too, you know, he can't have too much of a spread. I, I get upset when I'm traveling and the kids invite him over for dinner and I'm going, well, when he's traveling, how come you don't invite me? Right. I'm always yeah. doing comparison. And so we have to make sure the spread is that way on the other side too. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, for women that are listening here, it's, you know, making sure that he has his own drive that you can support and that you have whatever your drive is, he's supporting your drive as well. They don't have to be the same drive. And I think that's a, I know this from my daughter, cause she's like, I want someone who's driven like I am in business. And I'm saying, it doesn't, I don't know that that works, honey, because she had that and she felt like she didn't get any attention. And I said, so maybe that you don't need the same thing, but drive. Yes. Pat, you know, whatever your passion is. So if your passion is for gardening, then make sure they have a passion, some kind of passion that they can follow. Um, but yeah, just recently, you know, I hit a ceiling, a glass ceiling of a financial glass ceiling, and I couldn't figure out why I was not getting past that. I just kept going, well, I didn't change anything. Why, 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 why? And I learned that in my childhood, staying in struggle is good, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? Let's stay in struggle. Let's just be, you know, close enough to success, but let's stay in struggle. And this, this has been, it reared its ugly head. Because Brian is now talking about um, retiring from the business I was in too. And he had that resentment. You left me. You left me in that business. And I said, no, I didn't. I was always working my way out. You didn't. You didn't have that drive to do that. Now you're not liking what you do. So you've got to figure out what you're going to do. But I told him, you can't retire until you have some some other gig. I don't care if it's entrepreneurial. I don't care if it's another job, another career. I don't care, but you cannot quit until you have a job. But guess where that stemmed from? That resentment of, you know, the kids were saying, yeah, but he's tired and this. Yeah, but it's his problem. He didn't get himself out the way I got myself out. So not my, he can't ride on my skirt tails, right? And so I had all this resentment and that's what I just worked through was, you know, I wasn't making, I would stop making a certain amount of money subconsciously because if I made too much, then he'd have a reason to quit because then we don't need the money. Ah. Do you follow that? Yeah. So I had to work through that. So what I worked was, well, what is Brian's? And I think this is a very important point for everybody. Cause I've just learned this. What is, um, 
what do you call money? What, what, what's another word for money? I'm having a brain fade with that. Um, currency. I mean, uh, currency. Yeah, currency. Yep. Right. What's his currency? My currency looking at him is he needs to make money so that I don't have to do all the work because I'm resenting right. that. Okay. Yeah. So that's, I'm like, you got to make money. You got to make money. You got to make money. It's not that we need the money. It's just, you got to. But what I realize is that his currency is taking care of me. His currency is family. Yeah. His currency is bringing me a glass of wine, while I'm having a late meeting. His currency is making sure I have food. His currency is, is opening the door for me. His currency is right now he's going because my phone literally died overnight. I'm set the alarm, went to sleep, woke up, it's dead. So guess where he's at right now? He's dropping everything in his business to go take care of my phone because I'm doing this. Oh, so what we much. realized, right. So what we realized is that we have to be aware of what that currency is that people are doing. So now we're talking about what are the drivers and then what's the currency that someone's bringing to a relationship because yeah. it may not be the currency you're looking for. I was looking for money. You make yeah. money so I can feel better about making money because I don't want to be the only one making money. Yeah. Yeah. It was a different currency to our relationship. Absolutely. So when I had that breakthrough, I came home from uh, an event. I was at a retreat and I had the breakthrough. Came home and I said, you quit whenever you want. I'm ready. I'm ready. Wow. Because the day he quits, I'll fly. I love that. Does that make sense? I love it. And it's so important, I think. And that's, that's, I'm going to thank you for sharing that, Jen, because that's brave and very honest of you to, to talk about those. I think, you know, even as successful as you are, and I think it's true, everyone is always learning, right? There's always distinctions no. and just shows how hard, you know, to have a successful relationship, you really have to work. Um, I do want to pick your brains being, you know, working with so many entrepreneurs and business people, you know, break up and divorce has a huge impact on your whole life, not just your relationship. And obviously, if you're trying to work and have a full-time job, uh, it can really be debilitating. And there's lots of studies out. Harvard Business Journal released recently some research that said it reduces productivity of employees by up to 40%, not just for the yeah. year of your breakup, the year before, the year during, and the year after. So three years of hugely reduced productivity. How did do you see this when you're working with people and what's your advice of how to power through that and keep going? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I see it with a lot of people and, uh, you know, because I, I coach, I coach mortgage loan officers. Okay. So they are, uh, you know, high, strong, <laughs> high, strong people, high achievers, you know, they're, they're really just driven kind of people. Um, for a multitude of reasons, not driven just for money, but just driven in a, in a lot of ways. And um, the divorce rate in the mortgage business is over 70%. And here I was in a mortgage industry for 35 years. In so I should have already been divorced. I should have been an alcoholic. The, the alcoholic rate is high. The suicide rate is high. I yeah. should have been all of those things when I am working with a lot of people like that. And by the way, and you know this too, uh, one of my certifications as a loan officer was a certified divorce lending professional. Yes. And um, it's hard because when I'm doing money, I'm taking care of money. Uh, it's hard to step into the more um, emotional aspect of it because that's not typical in financial services, you know, mm -hmm. to, to be, you know, speaking emotionally, but one of the reasons I became a CDLP is it just, it broke my heart when people came to me, men and women, and they're making financial decisions uh, from an emotional perspective and not from a logical perspective. And this is what I think happens when you're going through divorce or what I've witnessed as people have gone through divorce is, a, is all the decisions are emotional. And what we know about let's say sales or business yes. as a whole is that um, we buy on emotion, but we make the decision on logic, right? Yes. And so we're missing the logical piece of this. And so um, getting, having your girlfriends around you or having your, your guy friends around you to, for emotional support is great for mm -hmm. emotional support, but yes. you have to have professionals around you for the financial support for yeah. the decisions that you're making. And we've all heard this before, you know, with um, loss of a loved one, right? 
Don't yeah. make any decisions, any financial decisions until after a year passing of their passing. And I don't hear this happening in divorce. If we gave that advice to people who lost a loved one in, you know, death and we're losing a loved one, you know, in divorce, we should be saying the same thing. No emotional yeah. decisions for a year. And yet yeah. divorce yeah. happens so quickly. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, so the key, I think, is to surround yourself with emotional support with your family and friends, but go to a professional for that logical support to be able to make the right decisions. Um, so often, and this is why I work with a lot of divorce attorneys, they know their craft. They know, let's write this property settlement agreement up. Well, you know, you're going to take the kids. You're not going to take the kids. You get this, you get that, whatever. And they they are using a logical piece to this, but but there needs to be someone else, a neutral person in the party. And that's where we we come in as lenders is, um, when I was a lender, right? I still talk as if I am, <laughs> but where we come in as lenders is that, uh, you know, like for example, a lot of times, uh, women will say I'm keeping the kids and we don't want to disrupt their, their world. So let's, I'll keep the house. You take the yeah. retirement fund or you move on. Right. And so that's yeah, mostly what happens. It isn't everything. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the problem with that is that, um, and, and women think that they're doing the right, making the right decision. It, I don't know what kind of equity you have in your home. Okay. But when in the United States, for example, if you own that home for another four or five years, as the kids, you know, move up through school, um, by the time you, after two years, okay. After two years, you are now considered single and not married for the purposes of taxes. And so after three years, when you sell the house, even though you wanted to stay there for the benefit of the kids, the emotional piece of it, the financial piece of it isn't equal anymore. Cause yeah. he said, just take the house, you get all the equity. But the problem is there's a, there's a cap of $250,000. So if you sell that house and you make more than $250,000, you have to pay a higher tax. So you're looking at the house and saying, hey, I've got $600,000 of equity or $500,000 of equity. I'm going to get $500,000 and you are, but then you're going to have to pay taxes on it. Mm-hmm. And so if you had looked back at the day that you decided that you would have said, well, I'll take the house, but I also want this too, because that's where it's going to be equal when yeah. I sell yeah. it. But see, what we're doing is making these decisions. You know, I want the kids to be here. That's fine. And yes, I'm going to take 500,000. You you can't see your own ears when you're going through that. You need to have a professional around you to help you make the logical decisions while you're in the emotional state. I love that. And it's such good advice because unlike when somebody dies, you have to make those decisions. You're being you know, forced to go through that divorce process, make the agreements and get everything signed and moved on. But it's when you're in the biggest state of overwhelm, um, panic, fear, and yet you've got to go and do that. So, gosh, it's such good advice. Um, Jen, I could talk to you for hours. You've got such, such good advice for everybody. (laughs) Thank you so much. Uh, But one last question for you, because I think it's really important. And um, I'm going to come to that question. But tell us, where can people find you? If they want to find out more about you and follow you and get involved with your work, where can we find you? Yeah, I'm all over the internet, Jen Duplessis, <laughs> and I'm not Jennifer, I'm Jen with one N, Jen Duplessis, but you know, my website's jenduplessis.com, and if you're watching this interview, you can text Jen to 2676, and I'll immediately send you my first book, which is called Launch, How to Take Your Business to New Heights, if that's of interest for you, but that's a way to connect with me as well, and you'll get information about all the events that we have going on, and you know, all of those. And, you know, one of the things I do is, um, and maybe you know this, maybe you don't, I do a lot of events for business because I would help them with scaling, but I do a lot of retreats as well. And that's where these breakthroughs happen. Not, not at my retreat when I, I don't work on me at my retreat, I work on others, but you know, we do a lot of breakthroughs at retreats and that, you know, if you've never been to a retreat, that is something to consider. Um, you know, I started doing that when I left the financial services because I was so much about the logical side. I needed to get in touch with, you know, the mindset piece of it. And, and it has grown. I've grown more in the I'm like technology. I've grown more in the last five years than I grew in the previous 30. I love that. I love it. And I see your, you know, your rise, everything you've been doing. I just watch you in awe at everything you do. It's always so professional and you're helping so many people. Um, Jen, 
My last question on this podcast, it's called Heartbreak to Happiness. And I think it's really important to know what happiness is for you so that when you're going through tough times and working through, even if you're married and going through those stressful moments, it's important to know what it is so you can tap into it along the way. So what is happiness for you, Jen? So I'm going to answer this with a, with a, a poem and then I'll answer it the way I, that I, well, maybe let, let me just answer it the way I do for happiness uh, for me. You know, I, I always consider happiness to be fulfillment as well, uh, fulfilling. Yeah. And, you know, that's one of the things that I work on with my, my clients is, you know, my business owners and entrepreneurs is, you know, what fulfills you? Because even work is like a relationship, right? We have to make sure that we're being fulfilled. If you like, for example, I love this. I know, so funny. I love watching ants. <laughs> I really do. I think ants are the most, you know, one little ant comes walking around and then all of a sudden another one comes because he went like this, apparently, which you can't see. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're both trying to move a little crumb. And then, and then next thing you know, one goes away and one comes back with 70 more and they're all going to move the crumb. You know, I mean, they're just incredible to watch. I love watching hummingbirds. I love sitting on my, my deck with my cup of tea in the morning and just listening to the world wake up and all the unique times. That's what makes me happy. It's sometimes the little things and sometimes the big things, but you have to look at what fulfills you. And to get there, you have to say what doesn't fulfill you. I don't like being in crowds. I do like being in crowds. I don't like being alone. I do. I like reading. I don't read. Find out what you don't like and and you'll find happiness. It will eliminate all of the noise. You'll find happiness. Here's my mom's quote. It's almost like a hypocrite quote, okay? We flatter those we scarcely know. We please the fleeting guests, but we deal many a thoughtless blow to those we love the best. And Mm -hmm. I'm aware of that all the time. How nice was I to you at best you, right? Because you're a fleeting guest, right? We flatter those we scarcely know. Oh, and then did I, and I didn't, But I'm always gauging this, did I then when the elevator closes and we're leaving and going, you know, you shouldn't have said this, you shouldn't have that. Give my life and let we flatter those we scarcely know, we please those fleeting guests, and we deal many a thoughtless blow to those we love the best, including ourselves. Our self-talk, all these blows to ourselves. And I constantly, it's almost a prayer now. (laughs) It's almost a prayer. Just a reminder. Don't be rude and callous and whatever to those we love the best. And then turn right around and smile to everybody else. That it's such a hypocrite. And yeah. um, and I'm very, very cognizant of that. What you see here is what you get all the time. Yeah. Yeah. This and is- I love that about you. I do. I love that about you. And, and that is actually, I mean, it's taken my breath away a bit that because I think it really is powerful for self-awareness. It makes you stop and think, doesn't it? And it makes you look at your own life and what you do and I think very often we do take people that are close to us for granted. One thing that I notice when you're going through a breakup, the people close to you become very important to you. And I think you see the kindness and you mm-hmm. know, people step up that you don't even expect are going to step up. And sometimes the ones you expect to don't. So again, that can be an interesting self-awareness exercise of who those real friends are. But Jen, I mean, fascinating. Everything you say, so, so full of wisdom, so helpful, and so from the heart. And thank you so much for your honesty and your openness. Um, I know that that will have helped so many people watching and listening. Um, and thank you for being such a fabulous guest. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for being a great host. I love when we can both be on podcasts that are just curious. They don't have a driven, you know, the next question we ask everybody is, I love that. So thank you so much for, for um, starting my day off because I'm in the U S and I'm starting my day and I know that you're in the midday and, you know, I can't wait to see you soon. I'll be back over in the States soon. So I'll definitely give you a call and let you know what's going on, but thank you again. You've been amazing. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for today's episode. Do head on over to jenduplessis.com to find out more about all of Jen's work and especially her upcoming retreats. And I look forward to you joining me on my next episode. That's it for today's episode of Heartbreak to Happiness. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review to win a free ticket to one of Sara's virtual retreats. The retreats are a transformative combination of live webinars with Sara herself, coupled with empowering online video programs designed to help you cope better with your breakup and start feeling happy again. 
For more details, head on over to heartbreaktohappinesspodcast.com where you can also get a copy of Sarah's free gift. Thank you and join us again on the next episode for another dose of Heartbreak to Happiness.